Good evening and welcome. My name is Dananath Fernando and you are tuned into Public Space Sri Lanka. It was said when you are happy you enjoy the music but if you are sad you understand the lyrics. As a country are we really having a good time enjoying the music or are we really passing a time which we really need to understand the lyrics to discuss this and more we have invited an eminent political personality on our show today. I warmly welcome Minister of Provincial Councils and Local Government Honorable Faiza Mustafa on Public Space Sri Lanka today. Welcome you uh, Honorable Minister on our show today. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, this is the second time we are having the privilege of hosting our show outside our studio premises. It's a sincere privilege to have you. Just to start, start the discussion, I would like to ask you, who is Faiza Mustafa and tell, tell, tell us a little bit about your background. Why did you come into politics and why, uh, what, what, is, what is the reason for you to select politics? I am a lawyer by profession. I, had, I was engaged in a practice. I am from the Kennedy district. I was very passionate to do something to empower the youth and my hometown is Madhavala. And then uh, I basically did certain programs with regard to English and education in youth empowerment. And then uh, I was asked by Honorable Tondaman to join his party. Okay. It was a trade union which was a party so it, it was quite interesting the issues which, were, which they had to deal with and uh, he offered me to be the vice vice president of the party and I contested Kennedy district. So I got into politics basically because my passion for youth empowerment and also I felt that with the power you yield as a politician there is a lot you can give to society and not take from, take from society. So uh, what is your vision honorable minister for the country given your portfolio uh, on the as you know, I have a very difficult portfolio. As two layers of government come within the purview of my ministry, that is the provincial council and local government. So as you know, local government elections have not been held for some time. So with, there are many administrative issues. Some try to point the finger at me for the delay but I have continuously articulated the position due to the delimitation not being done correctly. I had to have an appellate process and that took some time. With regard to the provincial council, we introduced a new system where we had a mixed proportional represent system where we had a system where you elect a member for the ward and also 50% are elected under the PR system. So there are many challenges. My vision for the country is this country to be more secular and the youth in this country to be given a prominent role. Unfortunately today, after the war, we thought we'll move away from racism. We thought Sri Lankan identity will be given its pride of place. But unfortunately certain elements try to create racial disharmony and create friction between communities, not in the interest of the country, but for their political platform. The easiest way to enter politics is to show that you are a patriot and speak about your race and religion. Unfortunately, certain political parties today, their identity is their race or religion, which is unfortunate. If you are moving into being a secular society, irrespective of whatever community you belong to, you should first think and act as a Sri Lanka. Today, while saying this, I'm proud to say when I contested in Kandy, I got votes from all three communities. And for me, when the voter went to vote for me, my religion, my race was not an issue. But 90% of the voters in this country would vote for their race, their religion and their caste, which is very unfortunate. So unless we progress in our mindset, we will never have actual development. We, we, we if, if America can, uh, if if America if America can have a colored president, if India can have a Sikh as a prime minister, 
They're progressive. But how far or near are we from that? Uh, that's an interesting thought, uh, Honorable Minister. Now, one of the accusations from the, from, you know, since you represent uh, the Islamic community, I'm not saying you are representing, but you are Islamic, and one of the accusations from the other side is, uh, Islamic, you know, Buddhist and uh, the, 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 the Buddhist and the Islamic can live together, but it's the politicians who's trying to uh, dishearten their harmony. Uh, so, do you agree with that? Do you believe that extremism is exist in existence in both the ends? Unfortunately, extremism has been misinterpreted. Okay. Now, if you take our Islamic faith, there are Muslims who wear a beard, who wear a cap. Okay. By doing so, are they causing harm to another? There are women who want to cover their head, some want to cover their face, some want to cover their body. But unfortunately, when a woman exposes herself as much as possible, people don't seem to have an issue. But a moment a woman starts covering herself, a man grows his beard, he wears a cap. Muslims are portrayed to be to extremism. In my view, an extremist is someone who, who interferes with another's religious freedom of practice. Religion is a very personal thing. Today, some I have met, I have met some of my friends who have said, Islamic extremism is going, Muslims are wearing beards, their caps, women are covering. What harm? The issue is, if somebody wants to practice their faith, that's their right to do so. Why go and look at them and say they are extremists? What harm are they doing? Unfortunately, certain quarters in society is making use of our religious practices and saying that we are extremists. If, say, Muslims are trying to forcefully convert another, if they are interfering with another religion, if they are not allowing another religion to practice, that is extremism. But unfortunately, after the war, certain politicians thought what is best, hammer the Muslims, right, and try to book votes. But President Maitri Palasirisena proved them wrong. He, he, President Maitri Palasirisena won because he portrayed a very secular identity. And we have a lot to do to maintain that. We can't go back. There are certain quarters who are trying to go back. But we can't afford to do that. I believe that I am a Sri Lankan. Muslims in this country, Sinhalese in this country, Tamils in this country have no place. I can't go to Saudi Arabia. My home is Sri Lanka. And the Arabian traders didn't come with their wives. I'm a Sri Lankan. Maybe I, my ancestors would have had Arab blood. But I am as much as a Sri Lankan as you are. So I don't think just because I practice a different faith, I should, that person should be penalized. And you're bo you are today, are, you're a Buddhist or I'm a Muslim. Because we are born to a Muslim or single parents. That has been decided. Yeah. Majority of us practice religion. It's due to faith, not... Yeah. yeah, so practicing the religion, I think we all agree that it has to have the absolute freedom because it's a very personal thing. Also, the accusation from some extremist groups, especially towards the Islamic communities, especially on selling property rights. Sometimes there has been accusations they only sell it for uh, Islamic communities. So then they try to get the control of the land. Those are the accusations we see so, come often. I'm just throwing... No, you what throw it, but has any of those accusations been... Uh, it's substantiated. I mean, easy to accuse. Vilpattu also, they were accusing. That it was proved to be wrong. Saying that, that clear, they're clearing large, large extent of land to create Muslim settlements. It was proved to be wrong. They are easy, good slogans. But unfortunately, you are putting, your, put, putting us behind. We are, the issue being is, Nobody should ask one's religion or their race or their or whatever. That is where we that is where we are going wrong. I would also like to um, bring into consideration, given the Rohingya uh, issue, which has also come out very recently. What is your stance? Sure. Uh, they are UNHCR refugees. They are protected by the UNHCR. So they have they are, they are, they are given being in shelter. And this is not the first time we have had refugees here. So, if people want to distort it, right, 
That is also for the sake of what? Attacking another religion or race to, for one's popularity is the biggest mistake one can do. I mean, you have seen instances in the past where people have tried it and failed. I mean, the Rohingya issue is not a Muslim issue. It is an international issue and it is an issue where we have to have sympathy via the refugees. Via the refugees because they are sub subject to torture and harassment and they are, they are fleeing from that. We have to be compassionate towards them. Just because they happen to be Muslims to say, make certain utterances is not the right way to go forward. Uh, what are the remedial actions the government has taken on this issue because there were rumours and there were a situation where, which was slightly… Another day, what all but all Sri Lankans expect, irrespective of religion, race or creed, enforce the law stringently, equally against everybody. This is not rocket science. Whatever religion, race, we have laws. Laws are not restricted to the books. There are no, there are no, there are no persons who are who are above the law. Law, law is equal to everybody. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the Rohingya issue, uh, we understand it was uh, a, a United Nations issue, and they have been now planning to send it to say, abroad, giving providing the shelter. Uh, so. Uh, do you believe that the message communicated by the government or the authorities being adequate on this matter because it's an internationally related issue? Unfortunately, our communication strategy is sometimes not the best. So I think overall, there are a lot of good things happening in this government. Sometimes with regard to our communication strategy, we need to do much more. Also, I would like to make this a uh, point to pr give you a message to the community, especially the, uh, the different communities, Islamic, the Buddhist, the Hindus. What is your message as the local uh, government and the provincial council minister? What is your key message for the Sri Lankans? To think and act as Sri Lankans. End of the day, you may have belonged to a race or religion. Don't put that first. Put the country first. And don't do things what is politically right, but do things which is right. Unfortunately, today, lot of and in a lot of instances, people do what is politically right than what is actually right. People see how they can instigate people for their political advantage, but that's not the best for this country. We also saw, uh, not in the recent past, but also a few years ago, this this uh, Islamic Buddhist conflict start to come out? There is no Islamic and Buddhist conflict. Well, just because of what a handful does, you can't say that there is a conflict between the two communities. There is nowhere in the world, Sinhalese are the most compassionate people you can find in the world. And you cannot woo the Sinhala community by trying to bring communal hatred. That doesn't work and that will not work. Unfortunately, a few think by doing so that they can create a reputation or have political leverage, but that was disastrous. We have living examples during the time of President Mahindra Rajapaksa. These issues started brewing and certain quarters thought that they can polarize and that will be politically to their advantage. But at the end of it, they had the biggest setback by doing so. So, lessons learned, that would be the first. President Mahindra Rajapaksa won two terms. He won the war. Nobody is infallible when it comes to politics. And if you think by tolerating extremism or tacit acceptance of extremism, that you will be politically successful, the last presidential election proved otherwise. So this is a good lesson for politicians that if you do your mathematics and think that you can try to polarize one community and doing so you can get on top. It is a sad mistake. Uh, with that, uh, I would also like to uh, 
bring your attention, for, move your attention for the new constitution, uh, which is uh, discussing in media and in, among the community. So, what's the status of the new constitution? There's an interim report. Various parties have put their perspective. This constitution has had 19 amendments. So, we need to have a major transformation with regard to the constitution. But the Sri Lankan Pro Freedom Party believes that the executive president should exist if we are going to devolve power to the periphery. You can't devolve, you, if you devolve power to the periphery, you have to make the center strong. And that's the perspective of the Sri Lankan Freedom Party. But um, don't you agree uh, in the election manifesto by uh, His Excellency Honorable Maitri Pala Sirisena that uh, devolve, uh, the power need to be decentralized and the executive powers if needs to be abolished that is what was, so, was a promise. What was said by President Maitri Pala Sirisena, he was willing to shed all powers which are required in the interest of democracy. Okay as president and he has done so. His manifesto never spoke about the executive presidency being abolished. His, his manifesto spoke about the abuse of power due to excessive power being vested with the president and that we have achieved with the 19th amendment to the great extent and whatever trans further transformation we have to do, we will do. Now, in the interim report, what has been uh, suggested or proposed? Various quarters have suggested. I'm not a part of the steering committee. I just read it. But I'm sure whatever we reach, Buddhism should have its former place. This is a majority singular Buddhist country. Uh, the unitary state should be in existence. So, nothing which would, would, which would compromise our sovereignty in any form or moving to a federal state in any form will not be accepted by the Sri Lankan Party. Okay. We have been discussing about the existing constitution uh, process and much more. We are taking a short commercial break and we will be right back. Welcome back. You are tuned into Public Space Sri Lanka. We have Minister of Provincial Councils and Local Government, Honorable Faisal Mustafa, on our show today, Public Space. And this is the second time we are, we are having the privilege to hosting this show out of our studio premises. Uh, Honorable Minister, we have been discussing about the constitutional process. Uh, I think the rumors are basically coming on uh, the, the, the ninth sentence of the constitution, whether the Buddhism will be given the uh, the priority or whether the government, it's a right or a duty by the government to protect Buddhism. Do you, can you assure that sentence won't that have any impact? No, nothing would impact, have any impact on the form of, foremost place given to Buddhism. Unfortunately, certain quarters due to their political bankruptcy are trying to use various issues as their political platform. The foremost place given to Buddhism in the constitution will never be compromised and His Excellency President Maitri Pala Sirisena, as you know, would never allow that to happen. Okay. Uh, also, uh, on, the, on the constitutional process, how is the support from the other political parties? Because what uh, the constitution, you have to go for a referendum. Yeah, if there are certain amendments which require a referendum, it needs to go. I think at, it is at a very, there is negotiations being taking place. And I think it's very pre too premature to comment on how things are progressing. But everything will be achieved through consensus. Okay. With that, I move to your forte, that is the elections process. There has been, as you very correctly uh, said at the beginning, you have been accused for postponing uh, the elections and you have, there were discussions about bringing a no confidence motion against you by a Badulla district parliamentarian for not answering or avoiding answering the questions at the parliament and postpone, uh, postponing the election. So, you can explain about the process, actually what happened and why the elections has been postponed. The local government elections, the original delimitation done was done during the tenure of Basil Rajapaksa. Okay. 
he he was a pup he, he was a puppeteer and he had puppets who were doing it and he did it according to his whims and fancies and when it was gazetted all reports had to be gazetted there was a public outcry that minority rep rep representation had been compromised and that this has been done purely to the advantage of one political party therefore i had the power to appoint an appellate process i appointed the appellate process that process took about one and a half years to give me the report simultaneously the election commission has suggested certain amendments then that 70 30 70 ward percent wards 30 percent pr political parties want a compromise it was changed to 60 40 then there was an act, act passed to give 25 percent female representation the numbers would further increase so we had to bring that within the numbers which are already in existence so further amendment had to be brought so it's easy for one to comment but all what i have done i've done in the interest of democracy at large do you believe the second phase of there was a first phase of uh, demarcating uh, the 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 borders or the boundaries and then you were appointed a committee and that's right yeah so do you do you, do you believe the second phase was done freely and fairly i gave them the independence but it's not like when you repair a house which is already done there's so much you can do and i can i could only change the limit, boundaries of the wards nothing beyond i didn't have the mandate to create new wards so in that scenario within the legal framework we try to mitigate the damage the damage is already done but however i have taken steps to mitigate the damage but i wouldn't say the damage is no more in existence now what would be the impact if the damage has been not i understand it must it, it might not be able to recover it in full but what would be the impact that you predict no so i couldn't go for another for fresh delimitation so certain areas minor representation there was an issue we have mitigated it to a certain extent but yet those issues are in existence but if i appointed another delimitation com com committee and brought in a further amendment elections would not see in the light of day so when 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 can the sri lankan people can expect the next election that's the uh, january 2018 january 2018 that is the local government elections and provincial council elections in march 2018 okay and also um, the committee submitted uh, uh, was about to submit a report on 2nd of january if i'm not mistaken that's and right. only 3 yeah, uh, so the, yes the, what the, has the, happened there unfortunately I have to act within the four corners of the law. The law required that I need, I had to obtain the signature of all five, so I had to send them back to get the signature of all five, and they did that and handed it over to me. I was not ready to ex accept a incomplete re report, as I am a lawyer and a president's counsel. I would have acted in not in the interest of democracy if I did so. Okay, so once now you accepted that report, and then uh, what is the delay from there? for the going for the uh, local government elections no we brought further amendments further amendments. amendments and those amendments have been passed there's another amendment which is coming up on the 9th because the local the municipal council ordinance the urban council ordinance and the pradeshya sabha ordinance have to be amended to keep it in, keep it in line with the other amendment okay now according to my knowledge again there's a, uh, a demarcation of boundaries is progressing for the provincial That's council that's right today it's a good day you are interviewing me today the delimitation commission committee was appointed by his excellency the president okay so uh, how long uh, do you expect we have given them man their mandate is 4 months 4 months so 4 months after 4 months we will have the new boundaries right. for the and there is the appellate process where i test to go to parliament if parliament doesn't approve by 2/3 then there is a committee headed by his his excellency the prime minister and four others and and subsequent to that uh, the president will gazette it okay now the again it comes uh, the joint opposition the the strongest voice is why if you are democratic if you are if you have the faith on people why do you want to postpone the elections are you really uh, restricting your as a government restricting uh, yourself of going for an election so people wanted a change in the electoral system are we to hold a election under the preferential vote system and the 100% pr or people wanted a member who is answerable to them to the electorate or their ward and that's a paradigm shift which we have created
in the interest of democracy. Everything has its price. If we did not delay and go through this amendment, we would have had three provincial councils on the old system, and then once we legislate the new system, there would be six under the new system. And that would not be just. Okay. On the recent amendments which was brought uh, at the parliament, which is the 25% representation of uh, female candidates, uh, there was a, there was a, again accusation that the draft which was produced to the parliament agenda and what was actually introduced, there is a discrepancy. But there is no discrepancy. The bill dealt with 30% women, but as you know, in all democratic states, at committee stage you can bring in amendments. So due to the Supreme Court decision as regards 20th amendment saying that to extend the term of a provincial council you need a referendum, we had to legislate expeditiously a new system, otherwise we would have had to hold the elections under the uh, system before the amendment where there was a preferential vote and 100% PR. Okay. So with the new, now we have with the 20th amendment, the election system will be completely changed and also at the same time the government is trying to bring a new constitution. Uh, so in terms of the policy framework on the legal structure, there are many things are changing. Definitely, a lot, lot, lot is to be done, a lot, lot has been done. Yes, so now also some politicians, especially uh, the Jatika Helurumaya has mentioned this, this too much of changes will also drift country towards sort of a instability uh, positioning. I am doing what the people wanted us to do. People wanted a new system, we are giving them a new system. So I don't think there will be instability. I mean everybody in this democratic process can raise their concern, their views. But then again, President Maitripala Sena got amended to do these things and that is why we are doing it. Okay, and uh, especially on the constitution, I would also like to again come back to the constitutional process. Now, uh, it, it's a it's a mandate that uh, once or once everyone agrees and once it's get passed from the the two third majority at the parliament, it has to has to go for a referendum. Which one? The constitution, the new constitution. Yeah, if it has provisions which need a referendum, it okay. all depend on what provisions are amended. Okay. The constitution has specific provisions. Okay. Can you? Elaborate uh, uh, a little bit more for... Like the term of parliament, the term of the president, yes. sovereignty, the foremost place to Buddhism, all these provisions to change, you need to go for a referendum. Okay, so if any of those are changing, the you have to have uh, to go for a referendum. That's right. Okay. <coughs> uh, also, I would like to uh, <coughs> get your views on the other existing uh, issues uh, which has been highlighted, especially on the education issue, on uh, the tertiary education, on the CITEM. What's, what are the plans for the government Saitam now? CITEM has become a political platform. If there are issues, all parties have to sit and discuss. Not students boycotting lectures, which is detriment to the nation and to themselves. I beg to say I don't know the facts of CITEM in detail. I have not been involved in those negotiations. I have been following what's happening in cabinets. Uh, so therefore, my knowledge may be very restrictive. But I think the stand, there are issues with regard to standards, there are issues with regard to training. But then again, country needs private education. If people with resources can send their kids overseas and be, make them doctors, why not give a person who does, who does not have that kind of income an opportunity with some limited resources to get his son or daughter to make his son or daughter a doctor. I mean, free education is there, but globally, today, people are playing for education as well. Okay. Uh, now, you are a, a lawyer by the profession and you have in-depth knowledge on the legal procedure. Now, a few months ago, uh, you had to uh, sack uh, the existing government's uh, Minister of uh, Justice. Uh, Dr. Vijay Dasar Rajabaksha. So, how do you see? Do you do you really believe that the legal system has loopholes and it has its I, own delays? I feel that it's a prerogative of the president. A request was made by the United National Party, and His Excellency adhered to that request. I don't intend speaking about another cabinet colleague of mine. What has to happen has happened. 
as a profi as a professional as a legal professional uh, do you believe uh, the legal system uh, is not up to the expectations no any our legal system i being a lawyer there is undue delay there are various reasons for it so we need to see that cases are expeditiously disposed and the mechanism has to be strengthened from lawyers asking dates to judges numbers of judges being increased to, to issues of stenographers translators court houses commitment of lawyers because you know lawyers live on dates yeah uh so what as 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 someone who has extensive experience on no, the on the profession what what recommendations so I, I mean, do you I make i mean there has been continuous recommendations but we need to see that we i think if one issue would be increase the number of judges in the appellate courts so, second is to see that cases have to be fi finished within a more specific period okay. now there are no specific period. period it it drags for except areas like fundamental rights where a specific period has been set there is no specific period when it should be concluded so we need to bring in new laws and and the time given for lawyers to make submissions also should be controlled so in various quarters there needs to be changes made okay also i would like to uh, move your attention to the the future of the uh, the government uh, the unp and the self pilot government so how do you see the process you had an agreement till uh, till few months ago so what would be so, the next step i mean this coexistence is that in december we joined this government to primary electoral reform to bring in a new process with regard to the parliamentary election as well and we believe in certain social economic principles and we believe if this budget includes those provisions and the government has the fundamental principles which sri lanka freedom party believes in we could continue but it all depends on what bargaining we will do because we are equal partners in government maybe president maitri pala city sen and a few of us join before 8th of january but today it is sri lankan freedom party and the united national party nobody is bigger than the other way equal partners we need to be there with di dignity and self respect and we are not beggars in this government okay uh, also at the same time the president and the prime minister jointly introduced the vision 2025 so that extend you know, till 2020 no every through. country has its vision irrespective of whether you continue in office a vision is there for the country that should not be interpreted to mean that we are going to be in coexistence till 2020 2025 i mean that's a vision for the country every leader should have a long term vision for the country not restrict to his tenure of office it is for future leaders also to carry out that vision and everything in this country should be strategic with a long term plan you don't have a plan for your tenure of office you think long term and that is what we did not that we are going to hug and kiss the unp till 20 2025 we want a slp government at one point of time the unp wants a, their government at one point of time. here no party got a, got a simple majority this is not a love marriage or a forced marriage both were tied together the people stated work together and that is more, this government is more by compulsion than love if the unp and the slfp did not form a government there would be stability in this country one has to love the country before the party unfortunately majority of sri lankans love themselves before the country okay uh, also uh, i would like to uh, question you on uh, now you mentioned about uh, it's a 2020 uh, 2025 is a strategy uh, so uh, do you uh, has has a has a decision being made by the ex ex executive committee from the from the sri lanka freedom party that president maitri pala sirisena is going to contest for the second term uh, we have no other leader we want president maitri pala to contest a bit as lfp he is the president he is the leader of our party we don't want anybody else 
we want him to contest. Okay, uh, what Honorable uh, Faisal Mustafa saying was that Honorable uh, Maitripala Sirisena, His Excellency will uh, have a chance or a higher chance of contesting for the second time? No, for it is not whether he, Sri Lanka Freedom Party, President Maitripala Sirisena, today is the leader of the SLFP. It is not President Maitripala who will decide. It is the Sri Lankan Freedom Party who will decide that our presidential candidate is President Maitripala Sirisena. When you belong to a party, certain parties are dictatorial. Certain parties have democracy for the country but not within the party. But the, but the Free, Sri Lankan Freedom Party under the leadership of President Maitripala Sirisen, we practice democracy within the party and to the country as well. Most political parties practice democracy to the people but within the party, it's authoritarian rule. So the Sri Lanka Freedom Party expects the existing uh, President Honorable His Excellency Maitri Pala Sirisena to contest for the second term. We will discuss this on more detail after this short commercial break. Welcome back. We have tuned into Public Space Sri Lanka. We have Honorable Faiza Mustafa featuring on our show today. We have been discussing about the constitutional reforms, the constitutional new, the, the new constitution uh, process, and the provincial council and the local government elections process. I would also like to bring your attention to the next budget, which is about to come out in November, and at the same time we. We have seen the the, the prices of the uh, the fuel uh, has been increased in the world uh, market. So, what people can expect from the new budget? We want a social economic budget, and I'm sure Honorable Mangal Samariwar is doing an excellent job, and he is working on a very inclusive process. We feel equal partners in discussing this, this year's budget and I'm sure we would reduce the burden of the masses, create more employment, increase FDI through this budget. Uh, at the same time, uh, some of the state-owned enterprises uh, seems to be massively loss-making. Uh, any reforms that we can expect? I mean, I'm sure some of these white elephants have to be dealt with. Sri Lankan Airlines has been a white elephant continuously. So we need to make some strategic decisions and dispose some of these loss making state institutions because we can't burden the state coffers anymore, especially with our debt burden. So when, as you spoke about the debt burden, uh, many economists have predicted uh, that the, the most of our income, the, the, the repayment of debt is at a it's extraordinary a, it's, it's, high rate. It's up to here. Up to here. Yeah. Uh, it's above the nose actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so sorry, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I, think I, I was, I have gone further yes. or even higher. Yes. So, uh, what's, that also requires uh, so that a dramatic change of reform. I'm sure we have to do things to, in, to increase FDI and we need to have consistent government policy. Unfortunately, during the past, we have lacked consistent policy during certain occasions and that has been detrimental to FDI coming in. So we need to work on an inclusive process and uh, have a very, what shall I say, a very consistent policy where investment could come here and say this is under the rules and regulations I'll be faced with for the next five or ten years. Ad hoc change would be detrimental. Don't you think the government is trying to do too many changes? I, I know you mentioned that people wanted this change. 
you are trying to do uh, bring a new constitutional a new constitution and also at the same time uh, you expect the election systems to get reformed and also the economy is not in a very good shape so it would be too much of changes uh, for the for, some for people some say governments do too too little some say governments do too much so maybe we will embark on a very courageous course let's hope it pays dividend sometimes when governments do nothing people complain here when the government is embarking on a very courageous journey some say it's too much so let's wait and see whether it's too much or or what we have done is right when you uh, when when the existing government ca came into power one of the main mandates were uh, eradication of corruption that's my next topic what is your sense on the current no so when you we got a mandate to eradicate corruption so to eradicate corruption the public service has to be more efficient there has to be greater transparency there has to be greater freedom the rti act definitely would be detriment to anybody who is trying to be corrupt so a framework has been put into existence to eradicate co corruption the bribery commission has been set in the independence commissions are there the constitutional council has been set up so we have a platform it is not for our, for us to bat in the right direction uh, the main problem i understand the the public sector needs to uh, strengthen in terms of eradication of corruption but how about the accusations or the charges being brought out for the former politicians on their corruption and misusing of public funds why this process is still no, it's getting easy delayed no is for people to complain any legal mechanism you can't just throw people in jail we have and everybody is presumed innocent until he's proved guilty that is a very foundation upon our legal system exists so there has to be investigation after in after investigation first has been tried i mean we are not a kangaroo republic where you can just put people behind bars saying you you can't just make a bare accusation and put people behind bars that i agree but also we have also seen certain transfers or changes of officials during no, this that, process is that is been done that is wrong i'm not going to hold a brief a brief anybody we shouldn't do that and we should do utmost to bring anybody who is liable for corruption to book talking a little bit about your ministry uh what are the now uh, you uh, you have been in this office for two two years, well, two years. Mm -hmm. what are the changes that you have brought into this separate ministry you can talk about a little bit about that i have you know i have all provincial councils and, lo and local bodies we have strengthened those the local bodies we have done major infrastructure at local government level we are we are uplift the the, war, the common the infrastructure in local bodies then we have brought in legislative changes i brought in garbage segregation if not for my decision for garbage segregation today the garbage problem would have been worse can you explain a little bit more on what are the remedy elections that you took in terms of garbage uh a separation uh, process we segregation, segregation process then process then together with the environment ministry we ban polythene so we we try we try to make the local bodies more environmental friendly we we try we have introduced compost plants all over the country we are encouraging more landfills and we are trying to see that the public is also more conscious of not just disposing garbage on the street and garbage to be disposed in a manner which is not hazardous to the country in addition to that we have we have done rural roads we have done rural bridges we have done sanitation i mean all infrastructure requirements of local bodies and provincial councils go through my ministry so it's it's a lot of work especially talking unfortunately about people have only seen the delimitation side of my ministry but when if you show showcase my ministry we've done a lot of lot to achieve uh when you uh, when you talk about the banning of polythene yeah. do you think it's a it's a progressive move because a, a substitute for polythene is still substitutes when a, a substance is banned people look at substitutes 
when you don't ban it, people don't look at substitutes. So you have to be progressive. You have to take stringent decisions. Because polythene has become a major social hazard with regard to the environment. Was it the problem is whether it's in the consumption or in the recycling? I have a feeling it was a decision no, so made. If, if, if people have not recycled polythene properly. So then the recycling to, process then, needs then to be strengthened. Then, you could deal with the problem directly by banning it. Bi biodegradable polythene is allowed. How is the, how's the uh, response from the market on this ban? It was uh, uh, enacted from 1st of September? I believe so. I mean, response, public perspective has been good. Okay. Uh, I w uh, also, I would like to bring your attention on the Sri Lankan Freedom Party. Now, uh, with the joint opposition, they are trying to come up with a new political party with the leadership of the former president. Everybody is entitled to start their own political parties, but nobody can destroy the SLFP. President Mahindra Rajapaksa said that the SLFP is like a salon door. People can come, people can go, but nobody can destroy the SLFP. People, there are great leaders who have tried to form their parties, failed and go and gone back to their parties again. Sri Lanka has a two-party system and there is no room for a third player. Now, again, uh, that also uh, somewhat brings Sri Lanka, as you talked about the Sri Lankan brand and you are a Sri Lankan and we are Sri Lankan, into sort of a, a doubtful wicket. So, actually, don't we have good leaders to take as the second layer? Because, uh, as you said, Sri Lanka Freedom Party ex expect Honorable Maitri Palasiri Sena to contest for the second term because we don't have a second... No, no, no. What I meant was, I mean, I believe that we have to be thankful to President Maitri Palasiri Sena. He, I'm not young, but comparatively, he has given people who are comparatively young responsibility. If you see the Sri Lankan Freedom Party, you don't have to wait. I have grey hair because... I had premature grey as well, but you don't have to be that old to hold a portfolio. Today, say, the energy with the youth, I don't, I don't think I can call myself youth, the energy with the younger persons have is today being made use of in government. Most countries, when you're much older, you, that get, you, get, you get the opportunity to serve the country as a cabinet minister. So if you see the SLFP ministers, there are, I think the UMP also has. I, I would like to talk on behalf of. He has given us an opportunity to to to, to, to the best part of our life to drive it towards the upliftment of this country. Now, uh, also since uh, Maitri Pala Sirisena is leading on series of reforms, as you said, uh, also the other contradiction is. Are you all drifting from the traditional uh, beliefs of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party? Whether uh, since the economy is in a bad shape, certain institutes need to be privatized. So actually, uh, Sri, that's sort Sri of a Sri Lanka Sri Lanka Freedom Party is not against allowing the masses to suffer with white elephants in existence. If state enterprises are loss making and do not contribute towards a service to the masses. If you take the railway, if you take the CTB, they, they, can, they have to be judged by looking at the social economic benefit to the public, say Sri Lankan Airlines. You don't need a national, you don't have to have a 100% state venture. There are enough private airlines where anywhere you pay and go. And nobody wants to subsidize the article. So you have to look at it from that perspective. It's a Hilton Hotel, there's a heavy blood burden. Like that there are, inst inst there are institutions where we the taxpayer and the common man through indirect taxes is paying for their upliftment and if, they, and if, can, and, and if those institutions are privatized, the burden of the masses would be less. Okay. Um, at the same time, I also would like to uh, bring your attention on the uh, Hambantota, uh, the port uh, uh, negotiation with the Chinese. Yes, so at the end of it, the entities were created and it satisfied all quarters. 
I don't think it's an issue to be spoken of because it's, a, it's a, I mean, people try to make it as a political platform. Today it's not an issue. Why? Because people try to create a political stage. But, but you can't sustain such a full, full home. We have been discussing with uh, Honorable Minister of Provincial Councils and Local Government, Mr. Faisal Mustafa, on the uh, privatization process and the next reforms that we can expect from the SLFP. We are taking our last commercial break and we will be right back. Welcome back. You have joined with Public Space Sri Lanka and we have Honorable Faisal Mustafa, the Minister of Provincial Councils and Local Government featuring on our show today. So this is the last round of questions. Uh, I would also like to uh, question you on uh, the new proposed electoral system, which is uh, not the proportionate system, uh, which is 30 percent pro proportionate and 70 uh, percent electorate uh, representation. Uh, no, it's 60-40 at local government level, it's 50-50 at provincial council. 60-40 at local government and 50-50 at provincial That's council. Right. So, in the existing system, which is the representation system, the, the, the candidates has to come in front of the people That's right. and they have a choice of, That's right. of a preferential vote. Yes. But with this, the new system, yeah. we have only for the, as you said, provincial uh, the local government level it would be 60 percent, only 40 percent uh, uh, preferential vote yes. and 50 percent uh, at the provincial level. Right. So, don't you think this would bias the leaders towards the, the central leadership? Uh, Unfortunately, people seem to understand we all are there because of political party. We have to move away from individualistic society, especially politics. President Maitripala Sirisena contested and won because of the collective efforts of political parties. I am today a member of parliament through the national list is due to the votes obtained by my party. No individual should be given priority over a party. So a party should be able to dictate whom they send as their legislature. We saw the PR system and the preferential vote system, people throw money, people who are not fit to be in parliament, but who have great resources at their disposal, getting into parliament, getting into provincial council, getting into local government, because money played a very pivotal role. That is taken away at local government level and at provincial council level, because there was a cry by the masses. Take the preferential vote system away, inter-party party rivalry. There were more murders within a party during an election than fighting opposition. The focus was more to fight within than with, your, with the opposition. So we need a paradigm shift with regard to that. That also brings the, uh, a massive responsibility towards the party leadership to, to nominate the correct. That's right. So if parties have to be responsible. Parties have to. Even under the preferential vote system, if the party doesn't give you nomination, you can't contest. You're going, your, your argument will go against you for the reason that if the party didn't think you're fit to be in their list, then the masses can't put a preferential vote against for you. So then again, it's the party. So if the party puts the right person in the right electorate, then the masses will be happy. If the party puts the wrong candidate, People like my vote for the party. Okay, so uh, given the new system, you are very much responsible uh, for the new uh, for both for both for yeah. the, uh, the for the local government and, and the. I am proud to say, I have done just by the country. Within a period of one month, we create a major transformation at local government level and at provincial council, and did what the masses wanted. So uh, let's again, if we if I if if we if we were to summarize the discussion with the new amendments for the local uh, the, the local governments 
what would what people would benefit how would how, what is the impact for the the common man common man game mantrituma there would be a man answerable to him in the in, to his ward to, in the province to electorate so thereby there is a greater nexus otherwise you come during elections spend money get your votes then stay in colombo stay at home and then go again during the next election throw goodies throw candies and then come again so today a greater nexus between the vote and the legislature that will also the legislature the, the 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 member and that will also have a representation of females for 20, 25% percent. 25% is there a provision for young uh, no there is that that has been given to the party to decide parties have to be more responsible and i said like our president mike palace said gave us opportunity parties also should give more opportunities for now how this would also be uh, how this would convert in the provincial council with the new uh, demarcation of the provincial council how this would have uh, convert to the provincial council level now we understand on the local government level there there's there a delimitation commission committee they are working on the delim they were appointed today so there will be electorates no my question was okay now the all the provincial councils uh, the elections will be on no, one one particular day provincial council like will be held in march the others will be held subsequently okay so we we expect three provincial in councils march. in march, in march right. okay but before that we'll have the local, local government that's elections that's fine and uh, since to summarize the discussion we talked about the constitutional reforms we talked about the the the, the racist uh, rumors and the noises coming around uh, we talked about the economic process so uh, are you as a minister who has been in the office for 3 years are you happy with the direction on the the collective combination by the government i would say that there's lot more. need to be done but we are the best option available the best option available for the masses is to strengthen the present present administration and get tangible benefits whatever anybody may say this government is here to stay until 20, 2020 so we need to work collectively and take this country forward if you were to change something so you said not everything is fine of course there is room for improvement what are the, what are the no, things that you think machinery decision making has to be faster do you think there is a delay and collective re- collective responsibility has to be adhered to sometimes it's free for all one minister says one thing another minister says another so it's unfortunate so there's a sort of a delay in the decision making process you're not very good at putting words into my mouth <laughs> but no i would prefer if there were great experience okay I put what you said in in a different part, in a better perspective. Okay. Uh, so what else? Uh, yes, I understand that. What what else do you want to change? What else do you think people should really? No, people's expectations are high. Cases to be dealt more expeditiously. Administration to be more transparent. We are transparent, but you can even be more transparent. And RTI to be utilized by the public. i want to give a message the rti is the strongest weapon against corruption so the public sh- should know what's happening in his vi- their village what's happening in government what's happening in their ministry and which is happening in their hometown and use rti to see that the government if the public demands more accountabil- accountability then you become more accountable and then that is the stro- power public outcry for accountability is the safest is the best safeguard against corruption now before you take uh, the office as the minister of provincial councils and local government you were uh, in charge of uh, the aviation for 100 days you for 100 yeah, days yeah. and you were uh, resign. you resigned and before that you were an advisor for yes. the president i i, I can i was the legal advisor to his excellency the president after i resigned okay what what made you to resign I was a state minister then there was a cabinet minister above me and I felt that there was no space for two of us to work so I would be idly and I wasted public funds by continuing to be there because I couldn't exercise my vision and my direction because there was a cabinet minister and I wanted to give him the room room and space for him to carry out his mission 
So, in the existing portfolios also we see there are ministers, the state ministers. No, it, 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 all, all, it all depends on whether you have the space to work. When I was appointed the state minister, I felt I didn't have the required space for me to work. And I for one I have options. I could go, I went back to my practice. So I felt I don't want to be idling. Now I had a state minister. I dedicated half my responsibilities to him. That is why when Priyanka Jaratna resigned, he complimented me and said, my minister treated me as the cabinet minister. Karu Paranavitana said, I did a lot of work during the tenure when I was deputy minister to Faisal Mustafa. And I, during that short period, I have done more for my electorate than I could ever do. He was with me for six months. So ministers should learn to give more to their state ministers and their deputy and work collectively than holding on to power for themselves. Since you talk about giving power to the next layer, it could be the state minister, the deputy minister, also people uh, would also expect the power to be given to them at the local provincial so, uh, levels. Uh, uh, definitely, definitely this government is not, she, not moving away from that, we will. So you are, uh, you, you promise you can, uh, you can uh, I, I say with assurance that this. Uh, I mean, you're, you're trying to make me sound the person <laughs> who go, goes back on assurance. No, I, I create, I try to create a conducive like environment to hold local government elections before. But the legislative framework and with regard to the delimitation, there were issues. So uh, somebody has to pay the price. So I had to pay the penance. So it's unfortunate. But with responsibilities, come praise, come brickbats. Okay, so that brings the last question. You can share your views uh, to our viewers. What's your final message to our audience? My message has always been, think as Sri Lankans, work as Sri Lankans, put the country before self. The only way this country can move forward, don't put your job, your personal benefit, your political party, your family first, put the country first. Put the country first, think as a Sri Lankan, act as a Sri Lankan. That was uh, Honorable Minister for Provincial Councils and Local Government, Honorable Faisal Mustafa. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, for joining us and featuring on our show, Public uh, Space Sri Lanka, today. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you very much uh, for you as well, for being with us, and we'll see you next Thursday, 9 o'clock, with a new episode of Public Space Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Good night.